That's what the fearful voice is telling you, is that you haven't done the work to prepare for the real world in which you're going to feel those pressures right away. So I look at fear and greed as the precondition for everything. I expect that. In fact, if I don't feel fear and greed, I'm wondering what's wrong with me. I don't know if my head is right. But as a professional, I know what to do with the gift of fear and greed. The fearful moment tells me, have I done the due diligence to establish the risk reward ratios and the stop losses with redundancy and trading at a proper level of risk? And then when I feel greed, that's a gift to tell me that, you know, there's probably a million other monkeys out there that are being greedy and are looking to pile in. So I need to be prepared for that emotion in the market reflected in a dynamic change in price and not be surprised by it, but learn to appreciate what the gift of fear and greed are, but without being overcome. Welcome to the Alphamind Podcast, where we talk about the behavioral, psychological, and emotional challenges of trading and investing. The Alphamind Podcast is co-hosted by Stephen Goldstein and Mark Randall. In this week's Alphamind Podcast episode, we are talking about the subject of fear and greed in trading. And we feature a true expert on the subject, Dr. Ken Long. Ken is a former US Army Lieutenant with 25 years of service. Although not active, he is still teaching and is an Associate Professor at US Army Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where he is currently supervising multiple master's theses focused on applying AI to military decision making. However, Ken is also fascinated by trading. His own trading journey began in the 1990s when he started investing in mutual funds. Since then, he's become an exceptional big picture thinker and tactical trader. And he has applied his love of trading, teaching and inspiring others by delivering a series of workshops for the Van Tharp Institute. But that's not all. Ken has also completed a PhD in organisational development and teaches at multiple prestigious universities. Aside from being a teacher, a student and an active trader, it is his insights on fear and greed in trading that we really want to share with you today. This is a fantastic interview. We largely have let Ken do the work here and in an hour and a half you will hear so much of his views, genius and wisdom on this topic in a way that is sure to inspire you and enlighten lighten your understanding of this complex topic. The FMI podcast is sponsored by the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. The STA are the world's leading body for the advancement of technical analysis and run fantastic education programs, diplomas, meetings and conferences on themes connected to technical analysis and trading price action. You can find out more about them on their website, technicalanalysts.com. As our sponsoring partner, the STA are delighted to offer listeners of the Alphamon podcast a discount on their outstanding STA home study course and STA home study course and diploma program. You can find out details about this by going to the Alphamon blog, which you can find at alphaminblog.blogspot.com or just Googling Alphamon blog and then go to the link STA home study course at the top of the page. Now on with this week's podcast. Welcome to this week's podcast, where we are delighted to welcome Ken Long to the podcast. And well, I'm going to go straight over to Ken. Ken, tell us all about yourself and how our audience are going to benefit from your great wisdom today. Well, uh, I don't know about all that great wisdom, but I do know a few things. Um, mostly, mostly because I uh, I listen carefully to my young soccer players, um, and most of what I know comes from listening to them. Um, We just had a great match yesterday. Uh, I pulled the kids together at the center of the pitch and took a knee. They're they're six years old. And uh, I knelt down so that they were taller than me and they could look down into my eyes. And I asked them, "Uh, does anybody have a plan? Uh, And Cooper said, I got a plan, coach. I said, what's your plan, Cooper? He said, protect our goal, get the ball, go to the goal shoot and score. And I looked around the circle. Is that a good plan? They all said, that's a good plan. I said, can we do that? Let's see. So we put our hands in the middle. One, two, three, thunder. Let's go. And, uh, and off we went and uh, they pretty much did that. And whenever the ball was in play and wherever it goes, that one of those things is what we should be doing. If we don't have the ball uh, protect our goal, but if we've protected the goal, now we can go get the ball. And if we got the ball, now we can go to the goal. 
hey, what if they get in the way? Go around them. Uh, what if two people come at you? We'll pass the ball, I guess. But get into the box, shoot, and score. So, and then just add all sorts of uh, enthusiasm and build on the motivation of the crowd. Use all that energy and always have something at top of mind that's focusing you on what you're doing. You know, parents are such great coaches on the sideline. I don't know if you've ever participated in athletics with families, but, you know, they're always helpful, like, kick it, get them, what? You know, and yelling at the referee. So there are all sorts of uh, energy that's coming from the sideline. And uh, maybe the most important thing we do with the kids is installing the power words that guide what their next step is going to be to take ownership of that inside them that they have the agency the power to do things and so protect the goal and i only say that to them probably a hundred times a day and uh and it's installed and then uh before the game and at halftime and after the game and before and after every practice we talk about who we are and it's what are the most important things and uh, play hard have fun support the team, love the game, respect the other team and ref. And that's how we judge ourselves. And I ask them, what's our grade for playing hard? Are we playing hard? Because you can't have fun until you play hard. But if you play hard, you can have fun. So I really believe strongly in the moment um, and mindfulness, you know, and I'm humbled to be in Mark's presence. He's done such great work on that. And I think it's central. And here's the problem that I see with uh, mindfulness um, and decision-making. Um, it's the past and the future. That's the only problem we really have. And the problem with the past is that there's just so much of it. Well, surely I should go study all of that and back test it and whatever, and take all of that into account before I do anything. There's just so much of the past. And then, well, what about the future? Well, there's a lot of that too, it seems, you know, provided we don't blow everything up. I'm working on that problem too. We'll see. But uh, there's just so much of the future to contend with. Well, what about this? Yeah, but have you thought about that? Well, yeah. And all these other things I haven't even imagined yet. And everybody is trying to help me make decisions on what to do next are keen to point out all those things. So there you are, poor little monkey with your evolutionary brain in the middle of all that. And then all you got to figure out is what to do with everything all at once. And you've got all sorts of helpful inner voices too, which are reflections of all our background, training, education, experiences, helpful guides, you know, hated enemies, liars and deceivers, the world's full of people. So all you got to do is sort through all that and then just figure out what the next best thing to do is. So it's not unusual to see your sense of self and agency and action ability, if I can say it that way, your ability to make a good decision is overwhelmed by all the past in the future. Now, I'm not saying get rid of that stuff, but I contend that there is something that you can do to create a diamond mind. Uh, Mark's work talks about uh, mind fitness, military grade. I know something about that. Um, in combat, and you're a leader, and the bullets start flying, everybody looks at you. What are you doing? And you feel that all the time. You know that's going to happen before it happens. You prepared your whole life for that. But then it happens, and that's a special moment. And your training can help you, but it's not everything. It's what you do in that tiny little moment, which is the only time we can ever make a change. And here's what I've learned. It's your intention and your will and your artifacts and tools and your habits of mind and practices, all of that goes together in that mindful moment to make right action to change the world in some way. You want to change the world? It's a big place. You got to do work. And work means applying power to the wheels with traction, 
and taking that first step and keep going. So what we've got to be able to do is create a mindful moment that somehow allows us to endure all that pressure of the past and the future and all the exterior things and then all the interior things. And if we can create that diamond mind, that sense of self, then we can do something with our intention to change the world. And what I've learned is that if you start with gratitude and forgiveness for others, treat other people gently, find the best of them on their best moment and learn to be gentle and kind and nurturing and supportive to them, you have a chance to do that with yourself, which allows you to stay calm in the middle, to feel who you are, to connect to your intention with your heart, to look forward to figure out what the next thing to do is, and then just do your best. And if you offer that to the universe as a gift of your best, all in, just being exactly who you are, you know, it's the universe's job to figure out what to do with that gift. And uh, you don't have to do that. All you got to do is be who you are with good intentions, right actions, uh, be a kind and loving person and connected to your vision of a better world and just do your best. So that sure sounds easy. Let's just do that. What could possibly go wrong? Well, there's many miles to go before we sleep. And, and so part of our journey is to embrace all of the resources that we have to make better decisions. Harvard has been talking about for 20 years, uh, stop planning, instead make better decisions. And, and I support that. Uh, I've been a strategic planner for the Army at the senior level, and I know how that can go. And the problem with planning is the perfection syndrome that if I could just learn a little bit more and think a little harder and faster and bring in technology and computers, because that usually fixes everything, makes things better all the time. Um, if I could just plan a little better, um, then everything would be okay. And that can lead you into the backtesting trap and the perfection syndrome. And no, no plan ever survives contact with the enemy. One of my great heroes in life, uh, uh, General Larry Lust, was a retired two-star general and came to teach with us. And he used to come into my office as the chief of curriculum and work in great detail to really understand all the nuances of the lessons so he could go teach our soldiers. This is a guy that I had worshipped in his career because of his excellence, but he was coming to me. And I saw that what he did was take a pretty good plan, which was our lesson plan, but prepare like a maniac. He left no stone unturned. That meant he understood where we were supposed to go, where we might end up being, what the triggers were, how to rehearse, how to visualize, how to prepare. So if you were going to plan, I would just say, have a good enough idea that might work. Because there's only two plans. One of them is a plan that won't work. And one of them is a plan that might work. And the difference is in preparation. And once you get into that plan, you're going to discover pretty quickly if it might work. You'll know right away if it doesn't work. So preparation is everything. If you were going to spend 100 hours on tomorrow's plan, I don't know. Well, first of all, I don't know how you do that. But if you could spend 100 hours on tomorrow's plan, spend one of them on planning and about 99 hours on preparation, rehearsal, visualization. And at the end of that, you need to be able to say with total confidence to persuade your inner doubt, I am ready to work, period. And you got to put that period in there. And I'd say it out loud because you are laying a marker down. You have said that you've done your due diligence. One of the things I've learned is that we've been spelling due diligence wrong. It's not D-U-E, due diligence. It's due diligence, D-O. You got to do something to prepare. So I think about my plan. I come up with something that might work. Eh, you know, just good enough. Let me prepare that. And when I'm done preparing, I am ready to trade. I am ready to work, period. 
That's a claim. And I'm going to back that up with evidence and performance and assessment. Now I can go from plan and prepare into the battle circle or choose your trading metaphor. Maybe trading for you is a garden or it's a game. For me, what connects most strongly is the battle circle because of 40 years of army service in combat experience and uh, grappling martial arts of all kinds and soccer. I understand that world. So I use that as a metaphor and a model to prepare correctly. And when I go into the battle circle, it's me and the other guy naked and afraid and but ready to go because I know why I'm there. I'm connected to my purpose and I know that I've prepared. Now I'm ready to execute. I am one with the sword. You know, the way of the sword, the living sword. Musashi helps us understand that. Um, where you're not even thinking about the sword, you are the sword. And it is moving as part of the dynamic that it's in. If you stop to think about what you need to be doing with the sword, it's too late. He cuts you. So you must be totally in with your tools. They got to be part of you. And together with intention, you're in the battle circle and you're there to execute all of the things that you've planned and prepared and trained. Now, if you survive, that's a good thing. Um, and we're going to come out and we're going to assess all of that. We're going to assess our planning and our preparation and our execution. We are even going to assess the way we assess to make sure, am I measuring the right things? Am I judging it against the right standard? Are there blind spots that I'm not looking at? Have I incorporated my trusted others from our true storytelling circle, my accountability partners who are in it with me so that the people may thrive? And I've built that safe, trusted, truthful space to have an opportunity to get better. So all of that goes into the assessment of performance. But what if I don't survive? Well, did you work on the things that you were supposed to work on towards your purpose and intention and did your best and were as prepared as you could be and were all in? Uh, then you got nothing to worry about. The universe will figure out what to do with that. So I, I try to take that formula of plan, prepare, execute, assess into everything that I do. And it turns out that my co-creators, I used to call them students when I thought I was just a teacher. It turns out that I'm a student when I'm teaching. More on that. Um, but what I've learned is that plan, prepare, execute, assess has been the most profound formula for transformational change in every discipline where I teach. And that includes army training with the leaders of our future large organizations. I get to see a thousand of those guys a year and I work with them on decision making, stress management, mindfulness, transitioning from a direct action leader into an organizational leader who has to contend with uh, many different variables over long periods of time, much like trading does. We can't just pick and choose. We got to be in the game and survive even when it weather gets bad. So so in army training, in judo training, jujitsu, soccer, in the academic pursuit towards a PhD, where I focus on mixed methods research to help policymakers make better choices to support the people. How to do that with research, but also with practice on implementation. That's my research area, organizational change. So what I've learned in every one of those dimensions, oh, I, I should also say I was a shop monkey in a industrial manufacturing enterprise as a, as a young man. And I learned everything I know about quality control and planning and performance from making parts of braking systems for automobiles. And my dad, who was the design and production engineer, came over to me where I was working on this big hydraulic bender, taking a straight piece of tubing and putting it into the machine. And it would hit with 30 tons and bend it into a 30 degree arc. And that was 
one of the tubes that would carry the brake fluid that would reliably stop the car that was carrying a family in bad weather over the mountains so they could get home. And he said, you better make sure that you are making each one of those thousand parts today as best you can, because people are counting on us. They rely on us to a professional grade. And I would say that's one of the things I would teach about trading. And that's the difference between a hobbyist and a professional. You make a list of everybody that you know that's professional and what do they like when they're doing their job? And what is everybody like that does things for a hobby? You just compare and contrast and you'll know what you got to do to be a trader that can survive and then thrive uh, for the next 5, 10, 30 years. And so professional grade and due diligence together give us a chance to bring all of our resources to bear. And there's there's something about being a professional that on bad days, you go to work. In bad weather, you go to work. Hey, I don't feel like working today. You go to work because you have an obligation to the people who have entrusted you with their lives and treasure and the lives of their children. I've learned that from the service, that you never stop preparing and you never stop trying to improve because the people trust you. And so that sense of duty to others binds me to the missions that I'm on and the way I prepare and perform. And that goes into finding the energy to do the hard work of inner mindfulness that makes me better trader, better teacher, coach, and, and, and father. So plan, prepare, execute, assess, the mindful moment in between all the pressures of the past and the future, but also bringing to bear the inner game of finding the right things to do, validated by evidence, with trusted others to protect your blind spots. You know, there's that story of the elephant and the six blind men and every one of them sees something different or feels something different. The guy with the trunk feels one thing and knows something about an elephant. The guy on the tail feels something else. He knows something about an elephant. It's different. But you put six guys around an uh, elephant, you actually know something about an elephant, but only if you can trust what they're saying and you have a language that can be shared and a commitment to helping each other thrive, you have a fighting chance to learn something that could be useful for the team. So hat tip to Ed Sakota and the Traders Tribe, which helps us understand that trading is a lonely decision. There's only one room, room for one hand on the mouse when you make the click. And so you got to own that. But the tribe, the team is there to help you. And so how can we take care of each other and be stronger. That's why I love the story of Cooper and the soccer team. Our plan, our team, protect our goal. Respect the other team and ref. Learn from them. Be respectful to the game and who we are and play correctly. There's ethics and identity connected to all of that. So I think all of those things that we find in our lives that have helped us become successful in our endeavors. I mean, if you're listening to this podcast, you've got a computer, you're successful in life. And the things that made you successful there are no different than the things that are going to make you successful as a trader. All you got to do is figure out what those things are and figure out how to bring them in properly to the endeavor of trading. I'm working with a, with the senior firefighting pilot in the state of Texas he flies these little planes with the chemicals and drops them on fire. And he teaches guys how to do that. And his most important job is testing the planes that come out of maintenance to see if they're good to fly. And he tries to break them, take them to their limits. And if he doesn't break them and he comes home alive, they repair whatever he did. He does a gentler test. And then they repair it. And now they can sign off and give that to a pilot to go fight fires. Well, there is, he's been doing that for 30 years. So he knows something about that. And in about a week, using that plan, prepare, execute, assess, and the, 
safety, trust, truth, and opportunity model, he was able to see how he could bring in those qualities from the cockpit into the trading room in a proper manner. Not everything that he does in the airplane is something he should do in the trading room, but everything he does for preparation is, and the mindset and the will to be successful is there. So this is very much a many to one job in my view, where uh, you've got to find what works for you among all the things that might be done and then build the evidence base for justified confidence in your skill so that when you walk from the world into the ready room and you take off all the accoutrement of the world and look at yourself honestly in the mirror and then you put on your kit and then you walk down the hall of champions remembering that and who has gone before and who's cheering for you at arsenal and you walk out on the pitch you're ready and it's all in and you express yourself and then you assess and then we go back to work as as a coach all i ever tell the kids is look we're going to be who we are in practice that's where we decide who we are and in the game we're going to enjoy the moment and we're going to learn from our opponents what we need to work on but we're going to express ourselves and be who we are now my job as a trader is to ensure that I'm using the master's thoughts on that. Tharp think, position sizing, risk management. So that when I am engaging in risk, it's because there's a justified reward that I could reasonably expect to get. And I'm trading at a level that always keeps me in the game. And I my advice to you would be, whatever you think on a tested system you could trade at, Start with one-fifth of that and then establish the baseline of performance of a perfectly executed perfectly executed system. Do your best and assess and get better. I want a robust system that when I'm having a C-minus day, a below-average day, I'm still okay. That's a good system. If it's a good day for that system, it's easy. And that's the ones you see. The, hey, what's it look like when it's when the going gets tough? Can I keep going when it's that's what your business plan is for is on your worst day in the in the market. Do I have insurance and safety and um, protection and endurance and trust in my long term systems? So that I, each each trade that you're in, that feels like what you're doing. But really, you got to learn how to step back from that. Disassociate from that. Let the trader in you trade. You be the coach through a coach's eye. You're watching the whole thing because you know that that trade is one trade of the next 1,000 that you're going to take. And not only am I going to get the results of that trade, I'm going to get the raw material from that trade that's going to allow me to assess, add to my evidence base to make continuous improvement in small steps, well-balanced ready to change as the world changes around me, but going forward, I'm ready to work. Let's go. That So those are, I guess, some of the things that I would, um, I would say that have been beaten into me by, you know, the masters on whether it's judo or soccer or army training or whatever. Uh, all of those things are connected to who I am. And so by way of introduction, I'm a father a husband, a teacher, a student, and a warrior. Those are my big five. Nothing else matters to me except that when I'm dead, uh, I want my kids to say I was a good father. And I want my wife to say that I was a good husband. And I want my students to say I was a good teacher. And I want my teachers to say I was a good student. And I want the poor and the underprivileged and the voiceless and the weak and defenseless in the world to say that I was a warrior on their behalf against the forces of evil, whatever that is. Those five things guide everything that I do. 
So when I'm trying to figure out of all the things, what's the next thing I got to do? It's connected to those five things that are pulling me forward to be my best self with the support of my team and tribe. But that's what I'm trying to be. And when you are aligned with whatever your big five are, everything that you're doing is in in support of that. So you don't have to justify it any further. You've already done that. And you know if you're supporting your better self, the, the knowledge of the heart. You know, the knowledge of your head is figuring stuff out. The knowledge of your heart is who you are and where you're going and what you stand for in the world and why you're doing the things you're doing. And the knowledge of your gut is that fearful gift. It's the gift of fear from your inner self that says it's a dangerous world. And have you thought about you can't run from that. You can't control that. You shouldn't even try. What you got to do is realize that is a gift, a legacy from everybody that gave you your DNA that says, make sure you've thought about the tigers and the sharks in the world. Have you thought about those? And so what do you do with that energy? Something good, something correct. But you got to put that energy into motion in the right way. And the way you do that is with the knowledge of your hands of how to do things. A craftsman knows how to make wooden bowls because he carves wooden bowls every day. He learns to do that with a dull knife and then a sharper knife and makes that bowl every day. And then studies that, and he may do other things, but make one bowl a day, one good trade on one share, live, going forward. That is where I put my effort, not on back testing. The world is changing faster than you can even imagine with AI. Are you going to outplan AI? No. You, but what you can do is adapt and use your creativity, which it cannot do. I'm working on a project with DARPA, the guys who invented the internet, on artificial intelligence and competition to make better strategies and tactics to train our officers for existential threats. That's serious business. And we're studying artificial intelligence. And they've asked me to design a game that they could use to test different AIs that would give better chances of survival in combat-like conditions. And I'll tell you that what AI cannot do is be creative, but what it can do is gather information, organize it, uh, analyze it, synthesize it, summarize it, and give you a head start. But you've got to be doing the diligence that gets us going, uh, gets us going forward. So I would say the knowledge of your hands is how to do things. And then the fifth knowledge is the knowledge of your feet. And that is, how do I go to work every day and take the next step and do that for 30 years or a thousand trades with the same professional intention and commitment to all in and endure with emotional resilience? I got to learn to nurture myself. So I said, start with gratitude and forgiveness to others, the positive psychology, find the inner child that you want to nurture in them and treat them as that in all ways, gratitude and forgiveness. And then you just might be able to do that with yourself. If I'm being honest, I start every morning with gratitude that I have a chance and forgiveness for all the trading and the work that I'm about to do and everything that I did and everything I thought about doing. Gratitude and forgiveness. Then I trade. And then market closes. The next thing I do is give gratitude for the trading I did today, the chance to trade, and forgiveness for the trading that I did and didn't do. And then that is the bookends of all the activity in between. That is essential in order to be the better person that you are striving to be. And then you bring that into what you're aligned with. So I would just say gratitude and forgiveness. Learn to employ the gift of fear as a guide to, did I do my due diligence? You know if you did. You don't need to be told. Your accountability partners will help you. And then the greed is 
dude, there's, you can only carry as much as you can carry. Be proper, leave some for the next guy. And you're going to share that with others anyway for the next 200 years. So greed has no room in there. A greedy guy eats all the acorns. A proper guy plants some of those acorns so that we have more oak trees so that we can have a lot more acorns. You know, that's the secret of the squirrel, if I can say it. So, so that's my, uh, that's my introduction. Um, <laughs> well, and I, and I, uh, well, I'm great. I am grateful for you for letting me run off. So as soon as you're ready to uh, start recording, I guess we could get, Oh, we're on. <laughs> yeah, I guess yeah, we're always we're on. Always we're on. on. We're on. <laughs> well, look, um, <laughs> I mean, what's interesting to, to me is the sincerity of, you know, sort of revealing those 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 soft words, and of course they are soft. You know, the, the gratitude and the compassion, and 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 just the um, the reflection on the importance of self, um, and the various statements you made about purpose of understanding the things that are driving you ultimately. Ultimately. But to be hearing that coming from someone that's, you know, that's te teaching the army, I think yeah. it's, it's really important for people to hear that it's the soft skills that are making the difference in terms of the performance of, of these type of folk. You know, you can give people a gun and point and tell them how to shoot. That's one thing. But yeah. actually in these difficult, um, volatile, uncertain environments of which trading has distinct similarities with, with the battlefield, as it were, yeah. It's the attention you need to pay on 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 the real real meaning of self, uh, and what's yeah. powering you, and empowering you. I guess you know to get up and and carry on, and I think you reflect well on the the, the values of being stronger together, yeah. and and what wanting and be willing to share, um, and in your own profile being willing to teach too. I mean that becomes part of the purpose, right, um, for yourself. Uh, and not everyone does that. I mean, people, particularly in the trading world, I mean, myself and Steve have built our reputation on just sharing, you know, and build, and, and sharing the wisdom. But there's a lot of people out there that, you know, it's mine, it's mine, I'm not going to tell you nothing, yeah. you know, um, which kind of goes one way, I think. But yeah, um, I think there's a, I, I agree with you. You know, there's, you always see a guy, well, there's a guy teaching about trading. Why does, if he knew what he was doing, why doesn't he just trade? And that just says more about them than about a teacher. If you think about uh, the martial arts, um, when you work your way up to a black belt first degree, you now are ready to start training yourself. To get to the higher levels, you are required to go back and teach others. Now, why do they do that? Well, part of it is, is that as you make this spiral path around the mountain that we climb to get wisdom, if you lose connection to the basic, simplest, direct things, you've missed the point. You got to come down from the mountain to make a difference. So when the, when the sensei, the master comes around and starts talking about this, we're going to try to carve a wooden bowl here. And he's been carving wooden bowls for 30 years. And now he comes and now the novice comes in and we're going to teach him about carving a wooden bowl so if you just tell them about it you give them this great big plan and he's lost so what you got to remember is you got to sit with them look through their eyes and remember what it's like to be that novice carving the first bowl and it gives you a deeper appreciation because of the other paths you've traveled so the teacher learns from the student in the moment about the now that's kind of a selfish thing. The more I teach and the better I teach, the better I become at doing the things. So even on a selfish reason, it's it's good to do that. Uh, but I would call that the way of the bowl. I talked about the way of the sword before, about becoming one with the sword and going in and doing your thing. When you come out of there, you use that sword and the sharp edge to carve your wooden bowl of understanding and wisdom and intuition and feeling and if you've got a good sword carefully you're making a better bowl and that better bowl allows you to empty the evil and fill it with good and intention and that's going to make you better when you go to the sword 
So it actually is a dynamic between the way of the sword and the way of the bowl. It's the way of the bowl and sword together, that unity. So it's teacher and student learning together. In judo, uh, it, one of the translations is you and me shining together. You know, my judo partner, is, by throwing me, is teaching me. He's giving me an opportunity to learn how to fall without getting hurt. So I thank him for that opportunity to learn. You know, it's my turn next. So I'm going to. I'm going to teach him a little bit. You know. So, you know, uh, you were talking about the army officers and the soft skills. I get guys when they are 10 years in service, 35 years old, um, and they've got combat experience in direct firefights and things like that. And they have to learn how to become a leader of a thousand or 5,000 soldiers. It's not just personal example anymore. They've got to give orders that other people have to execute. And their biggest challenge is their sense of humility and their self-awareness of who they are. And they don't feel like they're ready because they're honest that they, they know what they don't know. But what I show them in the group is that you get five or six guys that know 20 or 30 percent. And you get around the elephant, you start trusting and rely, you know enough and I give them all sorts of examples to prove that that's actually true, but that it requires us to operate on the basis of trust right from the beginning. And the example that I use with our senior leaders, because I'm teaching even our generals how to use stories to generate truthful spaces where people can trust. I would just ask you, how many of all the meetings you've ever been in, how much time in that meeting has been spent trying to determine what the other guy's doing to get over or to screw you or whatever, he's going to somehow abuse you? 90%. And what if I get through all that, I get 10% of my energy left to do something positive and affirmative, but I've just spent hours imagining him to be a bad person. And now do I really want to work? So that's why it's really hard to get anything done on teams. But if I could start every session, every meeting, every accountability group with an evidence-based belief that my accountability partner is there to tell the best truth that he can so that I may thrive and we can thrive together. And on the basis of that, we're going to go forward as a community of practice. That's unstoppable. And that sensibility, that leadership skill. That's a learnable skill in the sense that you can practice it and get better and learn to trust a little more and learn to tell the truth a little bit more. Uh, I don't have to tell men of a certain age what happens if you tell the unvarnished truth without regard to your setting, your situation. The world can come at you with a hammer if you do that sometimes. You, gotta, you have to create spaces and teams within which you can leverage the power of truth and trust and mutual support. That is a learnable skill. It's an experience that you have to have. You can't read it in a book and then just do it. You've got to actually live that experience. And that's why I, when I, to bring that back to trading, I am an advocate of trading one share live going forward with your best system and then study that carefully. I think if you did that 50 times on one share risking $1, it would cost you 50 bucks if you lost every trade plus a couple pennies for the uh, commission, you would learn more from those 50 trades and that 50 bucks than spending $5,000 with a back test in the system that was perfect in the lab. Because then you got to bring that into the world and now you got to trade it. The very first time it goes against you, your fearful mind will just discount all that because there's something in our lived experience that tells us there's more to life than just the ivory tower. There is the due diligence. There's the knowledge in action of our hands. And that's what the that's what the fearful voice is telling you, is that you haven't done the work to prepare for the real world in which you're going to feel those pressures right away. So I look at fear and greed as the precondition for everything. I expect that. In fact, if I don't feel fear and greed, I'm wondering what's wrong with me. I don't know if my head is right. But as a professional, I know what to do with the gift of fear and greed. The fearful moment tells me, have I done the due diligence to establish the risk 
reward ratios and the stop losses with redundancy and trading at a proper level of risk. And then when I feel greed, that's a gift to tell me that, you know, there's probably a million other monkeys out there that are being greedy and are looking to pile in. So I need to be prepared for that emotion in the market reflected in a dynamic change in price and not be surprised by it, but learn to appreciate what the gift of fear and greed are, but without being overcome. So I have to have an insulation. Well, you put insulation around an electric wire so that you can run your appliances. That's all we got to do is use our bulletproof mind or the mind fit, the diamond mind, to establish the insulation so that fear and greed can be what they are, a gift to me, which I am grateful for. Thank you for letting me feel fear and greed. Let me do something with the energy to make a difference in the world and do work with power tools which I can be licensed on, you know what I mean? And I can learn to use those things correctly. And that's what I mean by the way of the bowl. With a sharp knife, I make a bowl, and then I use that knife with the wisdom of the bowl to do better. And each one is reinforced in the other. So, yeah, you're, the soft skills, the positive psychology, the trust and teamwork that comes, the powerful use of words, to shape our inner reality. I say those words to my five-year-old soccer players, carefully, carefully chosen. Protect our goal. Every single word matters. And if you emphasize the words differently, it's a different message. I want you to protect our goal. Ah, protection. I want you to protect our goal, our team. That's who we are. I want you to protect our goal. So you got to know where that is on the field and where to position yourself to do. So three words, but each one of them is carrying a lot of weight. And if you get rid of one of them, it doesn't work, but there's nothing extra in there. So one of the things that we can do as a professional is learn to be beautiful and elegant and uh, efficient, no wasted motion. You watch a pro it's, Oh, watch a professional Mason building that wall. Fascinating. So that's what we can learn to do with our words, carefully chosen, reinforced, overtrain that it's, I just told you protect our goal. Okay. I don't ever have to say that again. No, I say that all the time before, during, and after the game, while they're in the middle of the play. If I only have enough time to do three things, I pick the three most important things and I do that as best I can. If I suddenly got some more time, I put that time into doing those three things better instead of adding extra things. I don't want to dilute the most important things. Figure out with the Pareto principle, what are the most important essential things and be excellent at those and offload the other things. Don't waste time on the trivial, but you got to figure out what matters. And so protect our goal, risk management, get the ball, see, get the initiative, make the affirmative step in trading. You got to make the entry. Here's the, I, before I forget, let me just say that we learned this in the last three years of COVID trading and nightly podcasts with bar by bar coaching live. There may be 10 decisions that you make on a trade during the life cycle of a full trade. You, you, you measured your risk. You estimated the reward. It was two to one or better. So it's justified. And then you make an entry, decision number one. And then you start adjusting the stops, two, three, four. And then you make an exit. Maybe it's the 10th decision. Each little decision that you made in the life cycle of that trade was to adjust your relative risk and reward as the market changed around you. And in fact, your decision to exit was not a choice that you made in the moment. The market decided to exit for you by moving price through your stop. So your 10th decision wasn't even your decision. So it turns out that nine of the 10 decisions you make in managing the trade have everything to do with adjusting risk and reward and nothing to do with the entry. 
And in fact, if you go back and look at the entry, it was just looking at risk and reward in the moment anyhow. So just get in. Now manage your risk. Before you get in, you're thinking about the trade that it might be as a member of all the other trades of that category. But you're in the trade. It's now this trade. So manage that trade. So if you're only going to practice one thing to be excellent at, it should be how to adjust my stop given the recent price move. And you never are going to lower your stop because you're not going to suddenly fall in love with the trade. It's only how is this the time to move my stop up or not? And so it's like a mountain climber. He starts knocking in protection as he goes. He puts that in before he starts falling. You put the protection in before you need it. And in fact, if you ever find yourself asking the question, uh, should I raise my stop? Uh, yes. Yes, you should. Raise it and then uh, think about it later. And then study, where did the impulse come from? It was probably an inner voice that said, I've either got capital to protect because it was an excellent move and I'm more worried about giving money back than I am about staying in longer. So the impulse, we can now, if we're, if we are letting the trade run and we're following our rules, I can now adopt a coach's eye and I can detect those impulses and I can use practice sessions and research. So what was the source of that impulse? And then that's just more work you do in preparation outside of the trade. Don't try to do that stuff in the trade. What we want to do in the trade is execute. You already did all your thinking during preparation. So respect that. Do the work to trade as you are trained, and then live to survive, to study, and improve the rules later. Try to do one thing well at a time. Um, so yeah, soft skills, the power of words, trusting others, learning to adapt, respond to evidence, all of those things are, are ways that we can engage with fear and greed in a healthy manner. Because if you don't, it'll just eat you alive. And you don't want that. That's actually bad. Don't get eaten alive. Uh, I, I learned that. Don't be eaten alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you thank you ken and um and that, that was amazing and uh what myself and mark love about having guests like you on is we don't have to do any work <laughs> we just let you go yeah. we just sit back and uh, you know some incredible wisdom coming through there we will return to this fascinating podcast shortly. If you are planning to upskill yourself as a trader or an analyst, or want to improve your chances of landing a job in the finance industry, the STA Home Study course may be what you are looking for. Developed by many of the leading minds in technical analysis and based on the STA's diploma program that was delivered at the London School of Economics, this course may be ideal for you. AlphaMind listeners can obtain a discount on the cost of this course. To find out more about this offer, Google AlphaMind blog or go to alphamindblog.blogspot.com and hit the STA study course tab at the top of the screen. Now back to the podcast. I, I, I had a thought as I'm hearing all of this and that amazing wisdom. It, you, you've obviously got a lifelong, uh, a life of, of many experiences, yeah. many rich experiences experiences that have probably been on the edge at times for uh, a lot of people um where you know could you could you take us through this journey you know yeah you obviously you by the sounds of it you learned from your father at a young age with the um the break my story. my father i mean now his totem animal is the owl right uh now you would think a nice cuddly wise little owl if you look closely at an owl it's also a raptor like they are silent killers, but they also see and hear everything. Their eyes are offset just a little bit so that they triangulate. And their great big eye sockets act as parabolic mirrors to gather sound. So they get their incredible detectors. But my father, this was a foundational exercise with fear and greed. I had, uh, he said, Hey, I got 40 grand in my retirement account. We're not doing anything with it. Can you do something with it? And I said, well, yeah, okay. And we turned that into 
a large sum of money with trading. Um, and uh, there was a time I went off the deep end with that account and I put it into a position. We were up there visiting on a Thanksgiving weekend and uh, I put it into a position right as the market was closing because of the agreed to get this amazing trade that I thought could happen if it worked. And as soon as the market closed and I couldn't get out of the position, the scales fell off and I could see what I had actually just done was I bet his farm on everything. And I spent the next oh, uh, three days in an existential sweat waiting for the holiday to be over to see what the market was going to do when it opened up. And I, so I didn't sleep that night. And in the morning we had coffee and took our walk and I said, well, here's what I did. And, you know, I just put your, you know, he's 80 years old and his entire nest egg is in that stupid position. He says, uh, uh, what'd you learn? How good is that? How good is that? Well, yeah. let's, uh, let's not do that again. Uh, or uh, maybe it was the right thing, but you know, what's the worst thing that can happen? Well, we've done, we, we've been broke before. We know what, so anyway, I learned uh, so many lessons in that moment about gratitude and forgiveness. It helped me create what I call the owl meditation, which is whenever I'm feeling the negative emotions, I just get a, like a five by eight index card. And I write down all the negative self-talk in the most vicious self despair and disgust that I can and just own it. And on the backside, I name all the emotions of negativity. I keep doing that until everything is out there on that sheet done. My bowl is empty. And I put that in an envelope, seal it. I go outside, I light it on fire and I watch the smoke carry that out into the infinite universe. And I sit there until it's time to do the next thing. And in that mental imagery, there is an owl in the evening on an oak tree with the moon by a still quiet pond, noting everything without judgment and nothing but love, gratitude, forgiveness, and respect. And that's my dad helping me do the right thing with all the things that we accumulate along our journey of responsibility to others. We do our best, but we're mammals. We do our best, but we did what we did. And so we got to find ways to process. So I learned that from him. That was an existential moment that when the chips were down, I could count on him instantly to feel that. And I never had that problem again. If you read Jack Schwager's uh, books, you see a lot of those guys that have survived all had those existential moments and learned something from it. It was different for everybody, but something about that, you got to come to, you got to look in that mirror of naked fear and greed and just accept and love and embrace and do, but do something about it. That's what I mean about take the next step, do the right thing in a way that builds you. And so the procedure, the owl meditation is something I would love to share with you guys. The second thing that I learned an existential moment uh, was a moment in combat. I was in command of a 750 soldier unit and the alarm went off and we were going to cross the line of departure and enter into combat. And in that moment, my life flashed before my eyes because in command of those guys, my job was to prepare them for what was about to happen. And there was just exactly nothing else that I could do now that it was on. We had gone from preparation into execution. And in that moment, I had to just judge myself and say, honestly, did I do everything that I could have done to prepare these guys for war? That's my job. And can I live with the consequences of whatever my shortcomings are? What I could have done more? Did I do as best I could at the time? Can I judge myself? That took about a half a heartbeat, but it lasted forever. And then it was, you know, we were in combat and then that happens. And you never forget that. Now, I had known that that moment was coming because I prepared my whole life in the service for that. 15 years of living with that in my head and in my heart. 
But in the moment, you still have to come face to face with that and be who you are. And can you answer that question? How do you answer that question in your heart, knowing the answer, and then live with that as you go forward and still trying to be better? It was so hard to retire from the service because if you're committed to it, you always feel there's more you can do. And do I, can I justify stop doing that? So I was able as in retirement to continue to teach there and offer what I still could. But every year I asked the soldiers and officers there, am I, should I still teach? Am I still relevant? And as long as they say, yes, I'll keep serve. So that was a formative moment. And the, the um, seriousness and responsibility of due diligence, I tried to bring that feeling into everything I'm doing on the soccer field. Now, I got to be light and positive and soft touch with the kids. I'm not in there preparing them for it, but I'm preparing them positively to be strong people. Um, and so those formative moments, those crystallizing moments, those reflective moments stay with you and you learn more and more about yourself. I like to think of it as, you know, sometimes we climb the mountain to get wisdom. Yeah, we also dig minds to go deep into our core to pull out all the things that need to be looked at in the sunlight. And then you stack that into the mountain that you're climbing. It turns out that that's the same work, that you got to go deep inside, pull it out in the sunlight and live with it, and then build that mountain of wisdom to be better. But you are, as a human, a conscious being living with intention in the world. You are the man on the top of the mountain. You're the man in the coal mine. I come from generations of Welsh coal miners. Uh, go Swansea. And, uh, and then there's the guy in the middle on the base camp next to the, the pathway that leads to both and the little stream where we get our water and in the little dojo where we do the work and in the little rest station. So people in their travels have a place to rest, recover, work, study, play, share, sleep, learn. That's what our community of practice has become in our mind is a place to do all those things in wherever our journeys may take us on this path less traveled with full respect to everybody else and their paths. I don't have to do that. All we have to do is be who we are and share and then use evidence and you know, statistics to figure out what's the right thing to do and, and to uh, go forward together. So uh, soccer, when I stopped telling kids about soccer, but listening to them, tell me their plans and helping them come up with those plans. When I learned to listen, I became such a better coach. Uh, so I, I put that, those little moments, like with Cooper and what's our plan? and learning how to use those words. I learned as much from those. That's as important to me as what I learned from my dad and what I learned uh, in combat, I would say. Um, those, those make nice endpoints. Kind of my, you know, my inherited legacy from my dad, the gift that I'm trying to help with the kids. And then that professional body of knowledge. And it turns out, and you know this better than anybody, Mark, that the mindset that you got to have to be a soldier, to be a trader, to be a leader, to be a follower, all of those things are so similar that the lessons we learn in our professional competencies are adaptable to the particular task of trading. And our job is to find out how to right size that and to leverage that strength and, and to, to learn to trust others to help us do better. So uh, those were, I guess, uh, yeah, and the fourth one, you know, uh, two minutes after meeting my wife, I knew that if I was lucky, she'd say yes. And I locked that trade in 37 years ago. And so far, so good. And I believe that she is... Um, ready to make a long-term commitment to me because she's been shaping me to be a better person. And I think we may be ready for a long-term commitment after 37 years of um, uh, adjusting the, <laughs> adjusting the stop. 
Yeah, I think we're coming up to, um, what yeah. are we, 87? Uh, we're close, 87 to, where are we now, 24th, whatever that yeah. is. Must be very similar. Yeah, I think we were 86, so we're right, we're right there. We, we could see you going to the chapel on the other side. Of the we were 86. Uh, we're 86 too, actually, because I got there the timing go. wrong. 86. That's, a, yep. that's a, make one good trade every 40 years like that, and you'll be that's all right. right. It, it all happened in the it all happened in the 80s. It all went on in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. I mean it's just so so you know, I mean we could have like five of these podcasts in a row, right? It's uh but it's good to I want I want to ask you a question though, that sure because I know that the audience um kind of from the if we throw a title up out there which is how, how do you deal with pain we get like yeah. the most massive response um now i won't go and ask you to go any detail about you know battlefield pain but from a, sure. a trading perspective in your journey you must have had some difficult times yeah. right in, in terms of yeah. trading up we talk about your, your dad's experience with his uh you know, your experience with your father and, and that fun but as you progressed into the world of trading kind of on your own journey, um, there must have been some tragedy in, in, in that journey. And I'm really interested to know how with your, with these skills that you've spoken about so eloquently yeah. in this conversation, how, how you've, how you've dealt with those things. Yeah. I, uh, I'm going to give all, uh, all praise and love to my uh, spirit guide, uh, Mike Three Bears who is a Lakota Sioux medicine man. Uh, he had a 35 year career as a petroleum engineer for mobile and then uh, left corporate and went and taught science in native American uh, reservation high schools for 15 years. And then uh, his mentor said that he had been chosen as a Lakota medicine man. And I spend a lot of time with him, especially during COVID and in what we call true story circles. And this has helped me with pain. Um, when we enter that true story circle space, that sacred space, Mike gave me three words to think about and to live. Surrender, empty, and nothing. And here's what he meant, as I understand it in my life, because I can only tell my story. Surrender for me means to accept everything exactly as it is and put it all in that bowl that we've carved that holds our understanding and feeling all of it the good the bad the pain the joy all of it without the pain there's no joy and uh, pain hurts that's why we call it pain it, it hurts and um it will usually leave a scar and a scar is a living remembrance of that thing that happened. No matter what else happened, that did happen. So the first thing is we've got to surrender to accept things just exactly as they are. And that's how they should be. And, and that's where it is. So surrender. Everything. Live. And then empty. I, I have to take all those things out until the bowl itself is empty and only I and my intention remain and my identity ready to, res I've given everything that was in my bowl that I accepted. I've surrendered all of that to the universe to let the universe put it in its proper place, wherever that may be. That's the universe's job. So I've got to empty and when I've emptied, the next word is nothing. And this was the hardest one for me uh, to live, to appreciate. And that was that after you get to that state of empty, 
nothing else has to be done or needs to be done or should be done. I mean, anything could be done, but nothing has to happen preordained except by an intention to do something that comes from you after you've emptied everything. So that has to be connected somehow to your central purpose, but nothing is required from external, like, oh, you should be doing, so none of that matters in this teaching. And what that allows you to do is to be in a position to live a fully intentional life, not forgetting the pain, not rejecting the pain, not trying to heal the pain. You can't heal pain because it already happened. And the memory of the pain is what lives on. But you can surrender to the fact that it did happen and it was exactly as it was. It didn't have to have a reason, but it's the simple fact that it was is enough. So surrender, empty, nothing was the most profound gift of love that I received from Mike Three Bears um, that I'm trying to live up to because my, my intention has always been to live as a warrior, by which I mean to live an intentional life. And when I was ready for his teaching, he showed up and I was just smart enough to listen and try to live and feel what those words mean to me. Um, now, as a living, caring, loving person who sees other people in distress and under pain, what can we do? What should we do? All I can do is to tell the truth about my own stories and how I feel and what my intentions are and what it is that I may be able to do as we journey together for a while. But I can listen. That's the other thing that I learned from Mike Three Bears is that in the true storytelling circle, you're coming into that circle with your best true story that you can tell about the topic to share. And you're going to do your best to be as truthful as you can. And when you've done that, you've emptied your bowl, and then you receive the truthful stories of others. It turns out that the magic of that is in the deep listening where you don't judge others try to advise them or recommend or shape them or just get, no, no, no. My job in the true story circle is to give the gift of my best truth as best I can, imperfect as I am, and then to fully listen to the truth you're telling just as a witness and a receiver of that gift. That's all I have to do. When we leave the sacred circle, there may be other things that we do. But in that moment, in the sacred circle, to simply sit in silence and receive truth, having just told your truth or your truth is going to be told, wow, is that ever something? It places pain inside the full human experience, all of it love, pain, joy frustration, disgust, enthusiasm, all of those is the universe experiencing those things through us. And we can do our best to be truthful about that and share that with others. And then try to be a little less judgmental, a little kinder, a little more gentle. You don't know what they're carrying. They may trust you enough to tell you, and so if I can be positive and helpful with that, I, I, I look at them and try to find when were they at their most emotional and vulnerable and their best. For me, it was when I was 12 years old. I was vulnerable and emotional and, and I just, I tried to love that little guy and nurture him 
and do what I can. But I, 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 I have empathy for that little guy. And I try to remember that little guy's in everybody. And can we, can we share the spirit and the fire of our love with those people doesn't replace the pain, but it's part of it. There's pain, but there's also love. And can we go together for a while in spirit? So I uh, give my thanks to Mike Three Bears for his willingness to listen to me and to talk to me. And that's what I can say about my pains. I have them, but yeah. And then he's taught me to say, aho, at the end of a true story, which is Lakota Sioux for as it should be. As you know, almost like amen. So, aho. Wow, that's powerful. You know, it's, I'm sitting here and uh, I mean, there's been an incredible depth of wisdom and uh, some deep spirituality come through this this podcast and I, i've been taken back to some of the other podcasts where we've gone down some spiritual avenues um in particular the one we did actually with van tharp um which we, we didn't know that he was ill but although it, it appeared to us that he was ill we could see it and yet he was still very generous and giving of his time it was a couple of months before he passed away um and, and i remember his table when he sat there because we, we could see him of course and uh, he had a little yoda uh, yeah. <laughs> model yeah, there man. which i thought you know that's that's fair yeah that's a sort of uh, a symbol of spirituality spirituality really where, where it kind of meets the modern world um and then when we we did one with brett steenbarger many years oh, ago pure genius yeah. that guy yeah yeah, yeah. And, and it was a you know, he talked about he spoke about spirituality in trading in a very deep way, and and you know sometimes I feel a little bit um, compromised when I do these uh, these podcasts and these talks with people. But they'll want answers. <laughs> they'll want you know how do I deal with a stop? How do I deal with fear and greed? How do I deal with the the emotions that are coming? There's nothing more spiritual about those questions. That there is no answer. There is no black and white answer. The answer isn't in technology ever. The answer isn't in an AI system or, you know, um, it, it, it's deep within you, within who you are, your core self, your spirit. Yeah. So, it, you know, you, you're you're getting to these very deep issues. You know, when, when I said we're going to talk fear and greed. You know, you've gone into them with, you know, so many levels below the surface. It's been quite amazing. Um, yeah, and, and I, that, yeah, I'm with you on that. I feel your heart on that. Yeah. And, and, and it's it's always fascinating when we, we speak to military men, because we've had a few on the podcast over the years. Um, um, and, and, you know, we're... we're we always feel privileged to talk to them because we're talking with people whose lives were on the line, you know, and, and it almost feels so, um, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not yeah. sure quite what the word is here, but when we talk about trading and numbers on a screen and profit and yeah. loss, and you're talking about guys going into battle and saving lives and, you know, being under fire and, and they always talk about it in such a matter, matter of fact way. Yeah, that's the only, you, you have to come to that conclusion. When I was a young infantryman and I was commanding my first rifle company, we had, this was actually before the computers. And yeah. we had a, we had a photocopied book of wisdom that our senior leaders passed to us. And one of the chapters in there always stuck with me and it was, quotes of a dying soldier's last words and uh it must be a little dusty in this room i'm getting a little the the one i can see it as plain as day and 
it was a soldier who lay dying and his medic had come forward across no man's land to provide first aid and it was too late and this young soldier's last words were I knew you would come. God. Oh. That says everything. I knew you would come. Um, 15 years after that, I was studying with uh, Van Tharp, taking his peak performance course. And one of the things that I did was the values clarification exercise. And what you do is you list your top 10 values, uh, love, honor, duty, um, success, whatever it may be. And then you pick those, you pick two of them and you put them in opposition and you say, imagine a circumstance in which those two values are in competition. And then whichever one wins, that moves a little higher on the list. And you do that until you've compared each value with each of the other values. I made the mistake of doing 20 because more is always better. So it took me about three days uh, in a cave to work my way all the way through that. And to my surprise, and then not, but not really, the one that moved to the top of the list was duty, D U T Y, mm -hmm. duty. And it was higher than love and success and what it meant for after i had done those scenarios well how could duty ever you know be in competition with love so i had to imagine a mental theater of when that could happen and which way would i choose and it turned out that sense of duty was everything and that clarity helped me understand what duty the word actually means in my lived experience. And then all of those other words tend to be like lightning rods connected to your lived experiences and your stories. And those words can be general purpose. And sometimes they carry different meaning. Look in a dictionary, how many words have more than one meaning? Uh, all of them. Uh, and so when you do this, mental theater this visualization and commit to it you end up through your own reflection on your lived stories come to a much deeper understanding of what those power words actually mean so that when i talk about my sense of duty i know exactly what it means to me and it encompasses duty to self to my wife, to my kids, to my family, to my friends, to my neighbors, to my community, to my nation, to my profession, to the memory of the soldiers who made me what I am and who gave their life for their country out of selfless service and all the soldiers in any army before or the future that are making that same commitment. So when I talk about my big five, father, husband, teacher, student, warrior, that sense of duty is what the warriors create. That's the Dharma of the warrior is the service to others, the protector, but also the warrior of self to live an intentional life. So Van helped me understand how to uncover those things out of the darkness and bring it up into the light and true storytelling and my three bears also my spirit guides have helped me try to make sense of all that stuff and i submit to you that if you are truly aligned with who you are and your purpose and what you're doing that will manifest in how you do what you do and so people who trade for reasons other than it expresses their inner purpose can run into challenges when they have, well, uh, this money that I'm earning from trading is not right. It's robbing other people of their money. And so I'm a bad person. Well, you haven't gone deep enough into self to understand what all that stuff means yet. That just means you haven't done that work yet. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It's just, there's work there that 
can be done to help begin bringing these things into alignment and a deeper understanding inside our big wooden bowl. And, um, and I think when you see guys who have mastered their craft, they connect at that deep level, whether they know it or not. I think when you watch a poet or an artist or a dancer or a football player, or you watch Messi with the ball on his foot, he's being exactly who he is at his deepest fundamental level, expressing himself. That's why we love him, you know? And I think when, you know, your experience of seeing those uh, human qualities in the people that you've talked about. I mean, they're just, they're just so great and giving and sharing. Brett Steenbarger has given so much to the profession that he didn't have to, but it was who he was. And that comes through in the way he writes and in the spirit that you feel in those words he uses. Van was exactly the same way. And our sense of truthfulness in others is one of the things that actually happens in true story circles, I might say, is that you learn to listen to yourself telling the truth. And you realize you can do that to the best of your ability. And you listen to other people telling the truth and you start feeling what the truth sounds like and nothing else will do. And it becomes pretty easy to detect untruth when it enters the room, it's sort of like, okay, got it. I don't feel badly about you. I just, but I know what's going on, that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, the, um, this, the, uh, spirituality is what breathes life and spirit into the work of our hands and our heart. And I think you see that that's what I think you're resonating with in my judgment. If I can, if I can say that. So, yeah. Oh, <laughs> you're on mute stevie sorry i always do it at least once in every uh episode <laughs> um we could carry on for hours but i'm i'm mindful that we've um yeah. we've got uh we've got other things that we need to get on with um and i'm sure you do as well yeah. um do you want to i mean how, how can people find out more about you and your work and your your various sure. i guess the yeah I would say the easiest way is uh, tortoisecapital.net. That's sort of like, uh, you know, I talked about our little dojo, our little rest hall. It's sort of like Rivendell. We're a bunch of little hobbits, Linda. We're, uh, uh, for, you can rest there. Uh, tortoisecapital.net is sort of the, I'm, I'm not menu, but it's sort of the brochure of that place to visit. And what I've been doing lately is, is, having my students, I, I, I took this position. I said, if I claim to be a teacher, just show me my students. You know, if somebody tells me they're a coach, I just say, let me watch your players play. And then I know everything I need to know about you as a coach. You want to know what Pep Guardiola is as a coach? Watch Barca and, and City play. You know what I mean? So if you're, if I'm a teacher, just say, look at the work of my students. So I've been helping those guys develop their own courses and learn to be coaches, to carry on Van's work through me into them. Because I feel like that's what, that's how the stuff endures and continues to grow uh, is through the work of others. And so I've sort of um, been doing that. And you can see that work at tortoisecapital.net. Um, the Van Tharp Institute is kind enough to give me time and space on their site to have, you know, to offer some courses and I'm, I think I'm going to start doing some coaching for them because I'm, I'm feeling that need. And I think I have something to offer. Um, and uh, I have a YouTube channel that has uh, probably 3,000 videos of us doing the work and putting it out there and just say, I, what I found is that if you just give it away, then you have an empty bowl and people will help you with your shortcomings. They'll be quick to point out. Now, really, there's there's a hundred good questions and comments that come for every little, hey, you know, you know, every so you just learn to enjoy that, uh, I guess. So I, I would say that's that's where they could get more. And you see my email on there. I I try to answer every email every day. And I do my best. But tortoisecapital.net um, would get you well started. There's a lot of good. There's probably thirty or forty hours of pretty good 
lesson material on there for the, you know, the technical piece. Well, you said entries don't matter, but how do you enter? Well, it'll show you. Uh, you said, uh, how do you adjust the stop? It'll show you, you know, and, and we talk about those techniques. We're happy to do it um, and to get on with the work. You know what I mean? So, and I, let me also just say, I, I just resonate with what you guys are doing um, so much. And if any of the things that I've said about storytelling and creativity and, you know, one share trading, and if I can ever be a service to you, it would be really an honor for me to help you in that way. Uh, what I, I just gave a paper uh, last uh, two weeks ago at Pittsburgh to the Association for Business Sim and Experiential Learning. And what I laid out for them was what I've learned that the combination of stories used to raise creativity, plus the stories that we tell about our experiences, collectively create a learning environment that allows us to learn the other things fast. Like if I want to learn how to trade, I can use stories to raise creativity. I can use true stories about trading to understand the insights. And then I learn trading faster through this whole art of storytelling. My two academic mentors, uh, Angus Fletcher at Ohio State, has created story science in project narrative. And, and we've got some scientific papers that show that um, storytelling measurably improves your creativity better than anything. And we know from the work of Dr. David Boji in true storytelling, that's sort of the indigenous ways of knowing and the sacred circle and Mike Three Bears, that the collaborative learning that we can generate in those spaces make us community learning better. So the combination of those two things, I think, offer an opportunity to learn anything. And Mark, I, with your experience in, you know, coaching and techniques and leaders, these things, I believe, uh, add a lot of value to skills acquisition and help leaders understand their experiences really well. So I would be honored if, uh, if you guys ever had an interest in collaborating on some stuff like that, I would, it would really, it would, I only want, I'm 65. Um, and I just want to work on interesting things with interesting people so that the people may thrive. And my feeling is that we could do something interesting together. And I'd be happy to do that with you. Well, I think uh, I suspect we might be having another conversation at some point. And that's, uh, I, I, I see that. Can, I, can, I can see how that could happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, but listen, I think as, as we tie this up, I mean, any, in any normal podcast, I'd be saying things like, well, you know, might work, might, some of the might work is good enough and those types of things, but it doesn't matter because, you know, connect to the intention with your heart, you know, those types of messages, the purpose stuff, the diamond mind stuff you've shared, the, mm. the, the, the need to pay attention to soft power, but also the management of self in that, in that journey, critical for these nasty, difficult environments, but, you know, life in general, you know, it's not just, just that, but, I guess I want to end with with a message to you of I guess of gratitude from us of love from us of respect um thanks and you are the sword. Thank you, so, sir. Okay. Yeah, uh, I uh, gratitude and forgiveness. And I'm, I'm just gonna, gonna, I'm just going to echo that, and uh. I think I'm going to speak on behalf of our audience that they're, they're hopefully, you know, that they're, they're. I think I speak for them when you know. I'm expressing their gratitude here for, for a lot of what you And you've really given yourself there. I can see, we can see, you know, I, I'm guessing you need a bit of a shakedown and, and <laughs> you know, well, take some time yeah. after this. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I have a soccer practice in about two hours. So it's probably, probably the perfect. So I am, I'm so full of energy right now. Those poor little <laughs> kids, they're going to be doing some running today, boy. <laughs> But uh, I guess wow. also call out and thanks to, to Mike Three Bears because he's clearly yeah. been your guide. Um, yeah. And I, and I think back to, you know, sh shamanism and, and the storytelling of, of our ancestors yeah. and how that's how we learn. Uh, and clearly that's something that's uh, super supportive for your own journey. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we wish him well as well. So 
And a yeah. quick final debt of gratitude to Jeff Picaccio for, of course, yeah. connecting us. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, Je Jeff that. spoke. Yeah. Oh, Jeff yeah. spoke in you know glowing, yeah. glowing terms about you. You know, he was on our podcast a few months ago. You know, great individual. We've known him for a, a number of years now, and yeah. he's he's now chairman of the STA. Yeah. He's a very special guy. Uh, he is yeah. the a genuine, good, loving spirit, and boy, his mind. I wish I knew what he knew when I was his <laughs> age. You know, if I'd have known that, holy mackerel! He's he's really a special. He's a special guy. I really yeah. love that young guy. Listen, we we finished with a lot of love, so we're, we're going to leave you. Have a great weekend. Good soccer practice, and. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll, 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 we will speak again. Yes. Absolutely. Let's go gutters. <laughs> go the gutters. <laughs> gutters. Uh, gutters. Absolutely. <laughs> Take care. Thank you for listening today. We would like to thank our podcast sponsorship partners, Society of Technical Analysts, ESTA. You can find out more about our sponsors at our website, alpha-mind.net, or see the link in the episode description. The Society of Technical Analysts, the STA, provide well-beating technical analysis education programs. Alphamind podcast listeners can obtain a discount off the cost of their excellent home study course. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, we'd appreciate it if you could leave a friendly review or provide a rating for the show on whichever podcast service you use. You can find out more about us at our website, alpha-mind.net. You can follow us on Twitter at alphamind101 and at alphamind102. And you can connect with me, Stephen Goldstein, and my co-host, Mark Randall, on LinkedIn. You can also follow us and can check back over some of our past episodes on the alphamindpodcast.com. We wish you the best of luck in the markets. Have a good week.